Minister Warman stays with us for a brief foray into the question phrased as big data equals big challenges. There's a very big question mark there. Countering adversity in the data-driven economy. And the discussants are Dita Haranzova, Vice President of the European Parliament and the moderator of today's first panel discussion, Matt Warman, Parliamentary Undersecretary of State, Minister for Digital Infrastructure, Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, United Kingdom, Cecilia Bonefield Dow, Director of Digital Europe, Marta Poschlat, Head of the Public Policy and Government Relations for Central and Eastern Europe at Google, and Paul Timmers, who is a Research Associate and Director of the Sustainable and Secure Society Directorate of DG Connect European Commission in 2016. 2012-2016. Hello, uh, Paul Temer speaking. I hope you can hear me. Yes? Everything okay? Great. Let's go ahead with this panel. So the panel on uh, big data is big challenges. I'm very pleased that we have here this great uh, panel with um, very distinguished panelists. We have Dita Sharanzova, the Vice President of the European Parliament and uh, named MEP of the Year, one of the 20 most influential women in Brussels. Matt Warman, who you just saw speaking, the Minister for Digital Infrastructure DCMS at the UK. Cecilia Bonnefeld Dow, who hardly needs introduction, Director General of Digital Europe and the leading, um, leading figure in the policy making and policy discussions in industry and with policymakers in Europe and worldwide, and Marta Porchland, Head of Public Policy and Government Relations of uh, Central and Eastern Europe in Google. So this panel is about uh, big data is big challenges, and uh, it's clear data is one of the most valuable resources now in the digital economy. Um, it's experiencing an exponential growth. We see this phenomenon of big data. But data are also exposed to cyber threats and uh, can also be used for adversarial means like data poisoning, data theft, misinformation. And then there are all these issues around the CIA of uh, um, information security, confidentiality, integrity, um, availability of data, compliance, liability that uh, relate to data. In the meantime, we have seen uh, national frameworks coming up, and one of that is indeed from the UK, the UK data ethics framework, but also at the European level, data strategies are coming up. And within that whole environment, there's a lot of talk nowadays about things like data sovereignty, for example, in the European scene, data sovereignty, cloud policy, uh, Gaia X, I just mentioned the keywords here, European data spaces. So, we are going to look at data from two perspectives. First of all, and we keep it rather snappy, so I have to apologize to my panelists if I interrupt them, if they would be speaking a bit long. So first of all, we'll look at data in the perspective of cybersecurity specifically. So what is this about data and cybersecurity? What are the issues around misinformation, fake news, or perhaps um, uh, tampering with data or theft of intellectual property? And then we will look at the broader picture of data and digital strategy, data and the national interests, the competitiveness and those kind of things. Now, if it is okay in the chat box, uh, in the chat for everybody who is a participant here, you should be able to see a question coming up. And the question is, um, is data, uh, should data be part of sovereignty? And you can answer yes or no to that question in the meantime, we'll come back to that at the very end. So, without further ado, let me first get into this first part of data and a bit the narrow view, data and cybersecurity. What, what, what are the issues there? And if I may invite um, the Vice President of the European Parliament, Dita Sharanzova, to kick off uh, this for a few minutes and give her views on that. Uh, Dita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, and uh, good, good morning to, to everybody. Uh, well, indeed, I think you have rightly set up the scene saying that data has become the 
most valuable commodity that we have nowadays. And I will personally continue to be a voice for greater data flows, not only in Europe, but also with other uh, like-minded uh, countries. We have all experienced how we can use the, the, the mass of data for, for, pub for public purpose, for private purpose. But of course, with, with the amount of data that we are using, there is an increased risk what can happen to, to this data. I'm happy to see that at a European level we have managed to, to put to, on the table the first legislation on cybersecurity, but we have to step, step up our efforts. What is at stake or where I see the future is definitely when we will not see only the cybersecurity threats driven by the humans, but also the cyber security threats that are driven by the AI. And then the, there is a big question mark for all of us, uh, for, for the businesses, for, for the legislator, how, how to uh, address these, these new uh, challenges. Definitely this will be a cyber, cyber arms race and we must enter it. We, I mean the European Union, must enter it. I want to support the global, uh, global flow of data, but it must be based and relying on mutual agreements and common understanding. Excellent. Dita, that's very um, helpful and I may actually come back later to you with questions about uh, what type of role uh, in the particular space of AI, data and cybersecurity Europe might uh, play. Let's let's move to uh, Minister Warman. Uh, Matt, uh, can you um, give you a take on where you see the specific interest of data and cybersecurity and, and what that means for you in terms of policy? Please go ahead. Well, th thank you, and, and, and thanks again for inviting me here today. Um, I think we'll hear about the vast potential for data to enhance societies and to fuel innovation and growth, but its effective use is obviously limited by a number of barriers, and that includes fears around safe and secure and ethical data use. So, so maybe I can begin with an example which demonstrates the enormous opportunities that we can uh, seize if we get these these things right. Um, in our early response to the pandemic, uh, there was a, an urgent need for clinical trials to be faster and more efficient while remaining ethical. And so in a matter of days, we set up the recovery trial to meet that urgent need and patient data held on electronic health records played a really crucial role in identifying and enabling people from across the UK to participate in that trial. And I just use this as one example, but you saw 12,000 patients from 180 hospitals, 176 hospitals enrolled in the trial. And that identified one of the world's first coronavirus treatments uh, proven to save lives, uh, dexamethasone, which was adopted in the UK in June. And, and that's not a standalone case. It's a real example of data being the driving force in the modern uh, economy. And, and to unlock the value of that data more broadly, I think we've got to ensure um, that the physical and cyber infrastructure underpinning it is safe and secure and resilient, and that people trust that data. So the COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted the importance of resilient, trusted technology to our daily lives and the ability of people and businesses to move quickly online, adopting new technologies and changing ways of working, I think has been surprisingly fast for all of us. So. That shift has, of course, uh, not been without risk. We've seen criminals try and exploit the pandemic, which is why our, our own National Cybersecurity Centre has been so busy with the cyber awareness campaign. But we've also witnessed the absolutely critical role, uh, in particular, of the healthcare sector. And that's where, in some ways, trust is, is most important. So we're, uh, we've been supporting that sector, um, delivering uh, extra, extra cash to support consultancy for uh, security in basic cyber. And it's really crucial, I think, that we access the data, that we manage our businesses and we go about our daily lives through safe and secure technology. Because not only is cyber security really important to ensure safe data and technology use, we also need to ensure uh, that the data, that the infrastructure that underpins that data is safe and secure. An interruption to 
data-driven services and activities can cause real disruption to businesses, to organisations and to public services. So I think government has a responsibility to ensure that data and its supporting infrastructure is secure and resilient in the face of uh, the established, the new and the emerging risks. And, and it's only then that we can really see the economy grow. So so just, just briefly, that's why one of the five key missions in the UK's new national data strategy is to ensure security and resilience of the infrastructure on which data relies. And it commits the government to take much greater responsibility for ensuring that data is sufficiently protected when it's in transit or when it's stored in external data centres. Because the ability of government, businesses, organisations to share vital information quickly, uh, efficiently, ethically, securely during the pandemic is what's allowed us to function. It's what's allowed us to work from home, to educate our children, to shop for groceries, to do everything we need to do in a new and different way in this unprecedented crisis. So the UK government really wants to make the most of this moment. This is exactly what our recently published data strategy is. It's an ambitious pro-growth, pro-innovation declaration of intent for the use of that data. And I think it's time for a mindset shift in the way we talk about uh, and think about data, because we need to drive an approach that, hold, that holds something so that all of us can benefit when it's used safely, securely and ethically, and understanding that withholding that data can really negatively impact society. And I look forward to talking about this on the rest of the panel. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Matt. Just a, just a quick question to you here. Uh, the UK came out with the national data ethics uh, framework. Do you already have feedback how that framework is being experienced, how people are working with it? Do they like it? Does it work well? Uh, well, we have some informal feedback to that, yes. Um, but mm. this is always a sort of ongoing thing. I, I think um, one, whether it's GDPR, whether it's the data ethics framework, wh whatever it is, these are all all things that can Im improve, can be evolved. And I think we need to uh, bear that in mind. But the feedback initially has been pretty positive, And I think that's a good thing. Excellent. Thank you. Let's move to uh, Cecilia bonfeld uh, Director General of Digital Europe. Cecilia, we are very interested to hear your take on this, perhaps a somewhat narrow perspective, but a focus on data and cybersecurity. What are the main issues that you would say digital industry is being occupied with? So just to make sure that you can hear me and see me, is everything OK? Yeah. yeah. Super. Thank you. So. Um, I think we can. We have seen that uh, the European Commission has really put um, at the heart of the recovery uh, the whole data and digital agenda, and um, and rightfully so. And in fact, uh, last week we uh, we um, there was a communication from Ursula von der Leyen that they would um, dedicate 20% of the 750 billion euros that will be invested uh, in in European recovery uh, in the next year. Uh, to the digital, um, to the digital development of Europe, um, to basically uh, strengthen the resilience uh, on many aspects. Amongst are the cybersecurity, but not least also the capability of using data uh, across border. And um, and this is something that has been in the making for a while. We have seen uh, the free flow of data. We have seen. Um, uh, we have seen now the Cybersecurity Act, of course, which now with ANISA and the harmonization of the cybersecurity um, certification frameworks on, amongst others, cloud solutions. So I think it's coming as a natural, uh, how can you say, uh, accelerated program um, to follow up on the things that has been in the making for quite a while, and, and rightfully so. Um, it, uh, I would say some of the things that really we are occupied with is to get that harmonization of the cybersecurity uh, certifications. We have very strong countries in, in, in Europe who are excellent at, uh, at certification and have done this for years. And we have other countries that, are, you know, has some serious catching up to do. And that will be uh, crucial, actually, to have the common framework uh, of certifications to be able to uh, to prevent uh, cyber attacks and to be able to uh, protect um, uh, the consumers and, and the citizens in the same way. Um, 
But still, uh, hopefully, we will also see that uh, this uh, this further investment fund will basically boost the speed of that, because we really need that. Um, as you all know, I mean, uh, it is the data that we need to to protect and and the cybersecurity around the infrastructure and and. Um, and uh, and the products is is extremely important to actually make sure that uh, we don't have the, the the attack spread so fast. So alignment on uh, national rules, and now also of course with the uh, countries like the the UK leaving, uh, a strong international collaboration with some of the key partners. Um, and I think I want to highlight maybe that. Uh, that is the, one of the key things on both uh, on the data and the cyber. Uh, the international collaboration will be at the heart of the next uh, uh, work for the next two years. Um, this is not the way we see it develop now. We have data adequacy decisions with Japan. We have, you know, the need for harmonization of rule sets in these areas is enormous. And of course, somehow that is when we talk about sovereignty. It's always been about national, but here we actually have an uh, we have an area that doesn't really care about the nation state. And uh, for businesses, um, of course, we do care about nation state, but more importantly, we care about a common a framework of trust, which puts a, a high demand on uh, governments to really align their um, cybersecurity and uh, and data and privacy rules. Uh, so basically, we can create the growth and the poten uh, um, leverage the potential of, uh, of of data, the data economy. So for, for once, you can say yes, good uh, with sovereignty. But what we need is really a strong, strong collaboration and an understanding of a common framework, uh, so we can protect um, the consumers, the citizens, in a uniform way, also across nation states. Um, EU is working on this uh, very, uh, very thoroughly, um, but it's also very much needed to to collaborate uh, outside uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, Cecilia, I have a quick uh, specific question to you. You are involved in many of the groups that are looking at uh, the development of digital policy. <clears throat> And uh, certainly uh, at the si at certification side, as you mentioned, but also you have been involved in the, at the AI side. Do you think that these strands are well connected? Um, I think, uh, I would say, I think they will be. On, on the AI side, I mean, uh, uh, there's been a lot of uh, focus on ethics, and I think that's important, but I also think we need to move on from that now. Um, and really look at one how we leverage AI, the AI potential, also in cybersecurity, um, but uh, but also how we, uh, I mean, what are the different risk levels and really define risk in a very uh, well defined way. Because I see right now that the development, the innovation, and and the leverage and the potential of AI is still slowed down because we still have this: what is dangerous, what is not dangerous. There is like. 99.9% uh, of the things with AI is really leveraging benefits in health, in environment, in, which is not dangerous. And then we we are still lacking this, what is high risk? How do we define high risk? And where are the, I mean, the ethical questions well placed? Um, because I, I would say in many cases, it's not about ethics. It's really about efficiency and benefits. And, uh, and then we need to limit the discussions of ethics into the areas that are relevant to be discussed uh, in, in ethical terms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems to be, by the way, a general theme. We need, really need to be clear what we are talking about. I also heard uh, others say that before. Let's move to Marta Porsland, Head of Public Policy and Relations, Central Eastern European Europe, uh, Google. Uh, on that question of um, the specifics on uh, cybersecurity and data, what would be your take on that? Thank you, Paul. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I missed uh, the first few answers. Uh, six months of the pandemic and attempts to connect to stage video calls are a very good uh, example of why we're not at risk of taking of being taken over by the by the machines anytime soon. Um, but to your question, and after. Listening to what I managed to hear uh, from 
other panelists. I think we have two words here. One is security, another one is collaboration. On the security side, from Google perspective, where we are a steward of, um, of all our users' data, we need to bear in mind that users expect security and privacy of their data, but they're not expert in it. And I think the scale is extremely important to understand. Just to give you a sense of it, just recently, for example, we detected that there are 18 million uh, malware or phishing messages uh, per day uh, on our platforms circulating across our users. And that is just next to, and that was just related to COVID-19, and that is next to 240 million spam messages per day that also regard COVID-19. So this is uh, this is the scale we're talking about, and this sends a message of necessity necessity of being very careful um, when we look at the ethics, when we look uh, at the regulation in the vein that Cecile just uh, talked about um, before before I did. Uh, second of all, collaboration is key and that applies to cross-industry collaboration that applies to work to, to the work that is happening between companies and regulators uh, and and governments um, last but last but not least what i what i'd like to highlight is that in this panel we're talking about big data equals big challenges uh but we're missing um big opportunities and i think um Having on the back of our minds European competitiveness, European um, European growth, uh, we need to be very careful in uh, balancing protection and still uh, keeping the door open for, for an innovation. Much has been said um, before I before I got to speak. We've got excellent examples from the UK from the. Uh, coronavirus crisis response uh, development, um, all the sectors that are currently learning how to benefit from AI are also a great uh, testimony for why we should be having um, a balanced uh, a balanced approach. Um, something that was not mentioned just yet is uh, election, where is elections and protect, protecting, uh, protecting elections, both for those who are running them and those who uh, participate uh, in them as voters. And that's a good example of, of, a, of a sensitive issue that needs to, uh, that requires special attention, but it's also a great example of where you need to, call, where, where you need to see different actors coming together to ensure that the process uh, meets, the, meets the demands and high standards of security um, and privacy. Thank you, uh, Marta. In fact, uh, in a sense, you give a very good uh, lead into the, the second part that I wanted to discuss. Uh, take the example of uh, elections and what can happen to data there, misinformation. Um, it can go as far as that it actually really threatens uh, the democratic processes in a country. And we have seen that happening, and I think we all agree that uh, it is uh, absolutely a big challenge to make sure that data doesn't turn into misinformation, manipulation, and what have you. That threatens uh, the very foundations of the state. Now, we will come back to that a bit more at the very end. And, and for the audience, I cannot myself see the chat, but I think you have the question that uh, is data, uh, should data be part of sovereignty? But um, uh, all of the, the panelists emphasize, um, I think also very much kind of the opportunity side uh, and also the international collaboration side uh, of uh, data. At the same time, data are very essential, of course, for each and every country and ever more so. Data are very close to uh, national security. Um, the industry data, for example, is very close to national competitiveness. Um, and, and governments have realized that and they are taking these uh, large data initiatives. So I would like to get a bit of your view on the, on the data initiatives as they are developing at a larger scale. So let's move a little bit away from cybersecurity, but more at data as uh, a factor uh, in um, economy and society and democracy at large scale. 
Um, and I would like to invite you to give some views on where you think that the data strategies are moving. Are we heading in the right direction there generally, uh, in, in, in nationally in Europe, but also globally? Uh, what is missing? Are we um, uh, perhaps uh, being optimistic but a bit uh, naive uh, in this uh, because the world is, of course, not uh, always a very nice place and open liberal market economy is uh, heavily under attack. So I move back to the Vice President of the European Parliament, Dita Sharanzova. Would you mind giving your views on uh, where these data in the bigger picture is actually moving and should be moving in your view? Dita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, indeed. I think this is not a national topic, uh, it's at least a European topic and I'm the one who will argue that we need to discuss this issue more and more often on the global scale. When, uh, when it comes to the European uh, approach, uh, what we will see is uh, the new uh, data strategy that is coming, our new approach on AI, uh, there will be a new legislation I would say the biggest one that can change the world, the, the, the world of internet as we know it today, which is Digital Services Act. On data strategy, I think what we have seen so far is the fact that uh, companies are using more and more uh, public data for, for their own business purpose. And I would like to see it a little bit the vice versa, that we can also use some of their data, some of the private companies' data for the public purpose. Of course, we mm. must make sure that uh, we um, bear in mind all the trade secrets issues issue of the companies, that there are no free riders. But at the same time, I think we need to do more in this private, public uh, approach and see how we can uh, economize the amount of data that is available both to public and to, to private, private entities. Um, as for the Digital Services Act, I think we will see maybe a more call for the big platforms, as we say, with uh, great power comes greater responsibility. So there will be definitely a call for them to do more when it comes to ex ante, uh, ex -ante action. So um, that they are that they open more of, of their of their data. On artificial intelligence, and I agree with what Cecilia uh, has said, there will be a lot of discussion around the ethical aspects and how to make the European ethical approach different. We speak a lot about transparency, uh, which in my view sometimes is uh, seen uh, as a buzzword and as a solution that can solve everything. I, I, I am all in favor of the transparency, but we have to find the, the right balance and understand it correctly. Why we need it, I would uh, argue that we perhaps need for the consumers and for the citizens to have more explainability. Uh, and uh, my last point is on this uh, new approach to uh, so-called European sovereignty. I would be a little bit cautious that we don't go into the trap of the sovereignty, which for some uh, might mean uh, to, to have kind of Europe. Europe first uh, and start to think in our European framework only. I think uh, uh, from all the topics that we have discussed so far, it's evident that there are global challenges which we need to discuss globally, at least with the like-minded the like-minded countries. So I'm all in favor to see what we can do more at a European scale, but at the same time, I would be very cautious that uh, this European call for sovereignty would not lead us to more protectionist walls against others. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I may just ask you a short follow-up question. If you, you refer to the need for public-private uh, partnerships. Um, do you consider that, uh, what are some of the good examples in your view of public-private partnerships that you would say, well, that's actually a model that works uh, perhaps also even internationally? Uh, is, is, is uh, let's say, let's take the example of Gaia-X or the European Cloud Policy. Is that a good example? Would you say, 
We would rather talk about other uh, examples, uh, private-public partnerships as we see them effectively, for example, in the management of the internet, ICANN. Um, can you, do you have a take on that? Yes, I think you, you mentioned a good examples, but I, I would go perhaps further just to uh, see uh, the, um, the intern, the companies, the platforms, businesses, uh, that they don't uh, operate only in this kind of digital mind. I mean, we have to uh, understand the companies, for instance, um, like, like we see with the oil companies, so they have all the, the information needed for, for their business, uh, and they, uh, they share it with the public entity, so the same must go uh, for uh, in, in this digital world. Um, uh, from my perspective, what is important is to understand that all the data that can be used for the public purpose should be used. We have to find a good, as I said, the good uh, cooperation with the private companies. So, uh, of course, and I understand all their worries about the trade secrets, but uh, at the same time, we need to really embrace the potential of the data that they have, they have available. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. Um, in a sense, you are also already bridging to the final part that we'll have, but that's 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 good. Um, this is a very serious discussion, I think, that we have because we are moving into certain directions with this whole debate about data, and there's a difficult balance, obviously, between what we think uh, is good for global business and at the same time the things that we need for the protection of uh, for example our national security matt uh, for sure also well the uk certainly is perhaps not struggling with that but it's more than any other country confronted with that precisely because of, of its geopolitical positioning so what is your take on that question well, I think our starting point is, is that data and, and data use should primarily be seen as an opportunity to be embraced rather than a, a threat to be guarded against. And that was certainly our, our starting point for our, our national data strategy. But if we're going to harness that real potential, and I think we're, we're nowhere near harnessing the, the, the full potential, we need to ask some really fundamental questions about what data should and shouldn't be available across the whole UK, and we need to maintain a regulatory regime that supports responsible innovation, but also isn't sort of overly burdensome for smaller businesses, because I think too often perhaps we think about regulating big business, but we're, without necessarily thinking through the consequences for smaller ones. So, so we've got that in front of our Mind. And, and we're also conscious that we need to transform the way that government understands and uses its own data so that we can improve public services and policy decisions, and also to encourage cross-border data flows, to sort of allude to what you were talking about just a minute ago. But we also do need to take the risks of increased data use uh, seriously, because I think there's a huge amount of room for improvement. Uh, so, so we've got, uh, in, in our first uh, national data strategy, we've got four pillars. Um, and the first is to get the basic foundations of data use right, which means it must be collected and stored in standardized ways that work uh, across today's systems, but are also future proofed to, to as much an extent as, as we possibly can, um, and that that data is of sufficient quality. Uh, second, the need to get the right mix of skills to make this happen. Uh, and throughout the economy, that means supporting the development of data skills right from the foundations through to the really serious technical expertise. Um, third, we need to uh, have the, the fundamental principle of wanting to make more data available through better coordination across the public, the private and, and the third sector as well, as well as internationally. And, and finally, our, our fourth pillar that we need data to be used responsibly, responsibly and to be underpinned by trust. So that means collecting, storing, and crucially deleting data in a way that is lawful, secure, fair, ethical, sustainable, accountable, all of those words that are really easy to say and really hard to deliver in the right combination. But I do think those pillars are really key to unlocking the power of data for the UK, and they hold true uh, across other countries and, and other regions as well. Um, 
but what we what we do think we have to do uh, is identify what that means what delivering them means in practice so we've got sort of five key things that we think will do that and I'll, I'll just run through them very quickly the first is to develop that clear policy framework that says what government interventions are needed the second is is to make sure we have a data regime that drives growth and innovation while building trust um, and then to make sure that the benefits of better data use are felt across our public sector. We need to drive major improvements across governments, and I think almost every country would say this, and, and that means developing common data standards, interoperable infrastructure, uh, and increase un people's understanding of the benefits of data, crucially. Um, because I think with data now a really critical part of modern life, the infrastructure underpinning it is a vital national asset, driving growth, supporting cyber resilience and that's why that our fourth mission of those five is to ensure that the infrastructure on which data relies is safe and secure but lastly and, and very much uh, to, to the points that were made earlier it's the international flow of data that drives global supply chains drives global change gl uh, drives gl global trade and growth and they've been integral to the international uh, cooperation and research that we've seen over the course of the pandemic um, and we've seen it accelerate over the course of the pandemic. So we've got to champion secure cross-border data flows and promote really robust data protection standards domestically and, in, in, and internationally as well because I think it's, it's those missions that uh, see us seek to build on the UK's strength but also to ensure we make the most of the opportunities data can offer to not just our society, economy and public services, but um, across the world. And, and they don't, um, and, and nor does the framework strategy itself provide the final answer, as I said, by, by any means, but they do constitute part of a really important ongoing conversation about the value of data, because our experience of and our response to COVID-19 to date has exposed the importance of data, of getting good, timely quality data, and of making sure that the public have the necessary trust. So, so building on the lessons we've learned during the pandemic, we need to use those pillars, those missions that I talked about of the national data strategy to harness um, what I think are pretty endless opportunities of data as a force for good, and to ensure that it ceases to be considered a source of anxiety and, and, and mistrust and, and I realise just how ambitious that last bit is but I think it's crucial to delivering on the potential that we all want to see delivered. Yeah, that's certainly very uh, ambitious but I think it's also it can become very concrete and I think uh, one of the things that may be interesting you don't need to answer that uh, of obviously right now but if you look at where people seem to be on one page when you talk about things like trust and the good uh, the benefits of uh, a free flow for data in a trusted environment are these initiatives like take the Gaia X or the European Hell, uh, European data spaces, and would just be interested to see if that becomes part of an international collaboration. Where my personal view is that naturally you would first look at a collaboration with the uh, with the UK. Um, Cecilia, on that same question of, uh, let's say, the wider picture on uh, data and where we should go uh, in, in, in which direction we should go with data policies, uh, what, what are the takeaways that you want to give to us? Your sound is not, we don't have your sound. All good? Yep. Very good. Yes, thank you. all good. Thank you. No, I said uh, thank and uh, thank you to Matt because I think you are you're spot on, and maybe there is no better time in history right now that we are very much aligned with the UK and the EU to pr maybe practice on um, the relationship between UK and and the EU to basically define that common framework because. Um, that trust right now, I believe, okay, we need to harmonize within the EU, the data strategy is there, but we really also need to uh, put the pressure on the on international color. I said it before, but unless we have a common framework where we can basically can trust, uh, trust the cybersecurity in that internationally, we will not have a solution. The solution is not, uh, you know, limit everything on ground. The solution should be to aim for a common international, uh, you know, alignment on how we treat data security. Um, then uh, maybe going to the data strategy. I think that it, it's excellent. Uh, a data strategy or a strategy in general has to answer two things, the what and the why. 
And I think that's what it, that's really, really important right now, because when we talk about should there be a mandatory uh, private sector data sharing, the first question is why and what data? So, so to be extremely uh, concrete, because I mean, IPR rules, of course, uh, companies should not be forced to basically share. Hopefully by now, innovative companies know that data sharing and data pooling is such a competitive advantage that they will go there by themselves. If not, I think they will be, they might be uh, in trouble anyway, um, uh, long term. So, so I think it's very important to keep like private and public uh, discussions in the same goal on a vision, but not necessarily under the same, uh, you know, uh, uh, framework of, of sharing. And um, I think we have, if I just look at Europe, there is a huge task of data sharing, public data sharing. So, okay, we decided with the PSI directive and everything to release data, uh, to make it available, to have a, a format where it's readable, to have APIs in place. I mean, if we look at the countries again, we have a few front runner countries that has a lot of available uh, data for companies. And then we have a lot of countries that are moving at a very slow pace, meaning this really could be seen as a dis discriminatory uh, market failure, for, for example, for SMEs. So I meet all these great uh, scalable data companies on health, for example, and they struggle one, two years to get access to just one country's data on, for example, a radiology picture or whatever they need to, to use to feed their algorithms for their, for their applications. And by the time that they can actually get the right amount of data, meaning maybe two or three countries' data, out to use in, the, in their products, they are dead, they're out of money, they are, you know, they run out of competitiveness, so they're, they're simply not able to do this. So I think the idea of the public data space to, re, to pull the European data into a data space that gives the same data access uh, for SMEs as for bigger companies with a lot of more um, resources to, to harvest that data across the different countries in Europe would be like a major milestone. So saying the day that you are like a, a high, a high, a high tech AI health uh, SMEs, you can actually enter those data in a safe and secure way um, in, a, in a data space where you don't have to worry about uh, GDPR compliance and, and have, you know, 50 lawyers looking into that. That, that could be a major milestone. Uh, so I think for the data strategy, yes, but let's keep IPR and, and public data as two di different uh, discussions. Yeah, I think it's fascinating what you say, because I guess at a general level, everybody agrees that, you know, it needs to be trusted and there needs to be um, uh, non-bureaucratic access to these data. Do you think actually that this we should anchor even in hard policy that says certain performance criteria are uh, um, key performance indicators are necessary around data spaces? Um, but I... Haven't we done that already? Uh, maybe we're missing uh, still some some briefs, but I mean, uh, of course they have to be compliant with, for example, GDPR. I mean, we have a lot of legal safeguards in place. But you could even go further oh, and say, well, asking. response times are fast response times. If you need to have access to data, you're not going to wait for it for three months. You will have it in two weeks. Mm, I think that will be uh, extremely hard to. But again, it is the what, uh, the 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 why and and uh, and the when and the how, right? I mean, so is that all data, or are we talking like health security data that you need for urgent things? I mean, I think uh, the discussion has to be much more granular and not necessarily uh, uh, on uh, on everything. It's, it it would be too generic to to uh, to express views like that. That seems a wise advice, yeah. Uh, Marta, uh, same question on uh, the broader picture on data. A few words on that from your side. Of, of course. So uh, as, as the last one in the round, um, um, I can only tell that I agree with uh, much of what has been said before. So maybe what I can add is it's incredibly important not to think about data as the only solution to further innovate. And I think we this is one thing that we cannot lose out of our sight. 
there is much more to innovation than, than just data, and that applies to skills, the sentiment uh, around the role of technology in society and societies. And we should be thinking about broader ecosystems, where, of course, data plays a pivotal role, um, but this is not uh, this is not the uh, this is not the full um, answer. And there are a couple of things to to, to say about data in the context um, of Google. First of all, Google prides itself in data portability, so making sure that users have control how they use their data, how they move it, how they move it around, uh, around which. Uh, which, which refers to what Emily Haranzava said at the very, uh, the very beginning about the various options through which uh, data uh, could be uh, could be collected. At the same time, we truly believe that uh, we need to be extremely careful uh, and cautious and and keep caution against far-reaching uh, regulations around. Uh, data sharing. There needs to be uh, clarity in objectives, and rules need to be uh, clear, um, clear in scope. So uh, that's something definitely uh, to remember. And and I would say there is less to trade secrets when it comes to data sharing rather than keeping the highest possible standards of privacy and security. So again, something to uh, something to keep in mind. There are a great example of. Uh, of tech companies like Google uh, that already uh, share data and make it uh, widely accessible and, and first of all, useful. Uh, an example that everybody probably knows by now is, for example, Google Trends. Uh, and a new example that emerged uh, again under uh, crisis response uh, period was, for example, uh, mobility uh, mobility reports that uh, greatly helped health authorities uh, in figuring out what is the what is the what is the movement of um, of communities in certain areas uh, in, in aggregated and anon fully anonymized uh, manner. Last but not least, we touched upon a data sovereignty issue. I'm not sure if that's something you want to develop in this question or not. So, Paul, I'm looking at you. Should yeah, let me take now? that. Uh, if you allow me, uh, Marta, let me take that now as uh, the final one. I cannot see the, the chat box. I don't know if there are particular questions coming in, but as we have, let's say, not that much time left anymore, we might actually move to that question about. Um, data and sovereignty. So let me clarify a little bit uh, where the question is coming from. So the, the question that was also posed to the audience is, uh, should data be part of sovereignty? And uh, perhaps in first instance, uh, some people would say immediately, uh, oh, no, obviously not. Or perhaps they would say, obviously, yes. But uh, here, of course, the panel can give a nuanced uh, view. I was a bit unfair to the audience because the audience could only say yes or no. But the thinking here behind it is that you have, uh, if you talk about sovereignty, you would traditionally think about territory, about uh, the people that are living on that uh, territory. You would think about borders. You would think about natural resources. Uh, you would think about the culture of, um, uh, of that sovereign uh, state or the sovereign area. And uh, these are all kind of things that are close to the heart of uh, people and close to the heart of the state. Uh, and that, uh, in a certain sense, people would say that belongs to us. And for data, something similar is, has been said. For example, I think it's South Africa that says, for example, you're not allowed to export the genome of our people outside the country because it's from us. And certainly that her holds for certain uh, countries that want to protect uh, their uh, plant and, and fauna uh, life, and they consider that a national asset. Uh, you might say, for example, the data of uh, public administrations is, uh, is uh, something that is a national asset. And so uh, if you look at the answers that the public has, uh, the audience has been giving here, um, interestingly, two thirds actually thinks yes, uh, data should become part of the notion of sovereignty. And this is not the same as data sovereignty, yeah? but it's really more in the sense of data is something that belongs to the sovereign state or to the sovereignty of the people. And uh, one third says it's not the case. But uh, as said, this is not a very fair question. So a bit more nuanced answers from uh, the panelists uh, appreciated here. Dita, I give you first the floor. Is data to be part of sovereignty? 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I think that data um, can be part of sovereignty, uh, but but for me it must be still a part of or based on the free free trade. Because as I said, we sometimes use the sovereignty discord here in Europe, and for some it means really uh, to to build more walls in yeah. Europe and uh, have a protectionist uh, approach. Uh, I have personally spent one year of my life fighting for free flow of data in Europe. I'm happy to see that we don't have these national limitations and obstacles in Europe anymore. And I would continue to be the voice also to have more free flow of data with, with other countries. Uh, especially nowadays because what, what we see just to simplify the world we are living in that we have kind of two, two kind of uh, data families uh, one is the, the Chinese and the second is everyone else and what we share and I leave for maybe it's very simplified approach because of course everyone else it's not us Russia and Iran together but if I leave Russia and Iran uh, apart I think what we share in common us UK and the United States it's the cultural basis it's uh, the long-term history and I think the whole is also translated in the, in the digital world so I would very much argue for strengthening the ties also in the digital and I'm all in favor as I said building uh, European sovereignty if it's based on the on the global trade that's that's very interesting. Dita, would you say recently, I think there was an interview with uh, Thierry Breton, the commissioner responsible for digital and industry and defense, uh, and he said that uh, European data should be stored and processed in Europe. It belongs to us. Is that an expression you think? Uh, can you live with that expression or would you say be careful because this may lead to protectionism? Well, the devil is always in the detail, as I said. Uh, I fully agree with the general approach, but at the same time, and that's what I always argue with Thierry Breton, is we have tried in the past to create European Google, we have tried to create different European companies to just uh, in an artificial way, and we failed. So for me, and maybe I'm too to this respect, it's more really to tear down the barriers in Europe, to, to make a European market, fair market for, for the European companies so they can stay, scale up and grow in Europe. But I'm not the one yep. who will call for the barriers. Clear. Very good guidance. Uh, Matt, uh, from your perspective, is data part of sovereignty? Well, I, I'd echo an awful lot of, of, of what's just been said. I think that the world is, is hyper-connected and our ability to exchange data securely across borders is essential because economically it drives global business, it drives supply chains, trade, development, but it also promotes international cooperation. And, and, and I think in an age of COVID, that's more vital now than ever. So one of the key missions that, that, that I just mentioned in, in our national data strategy is, is championing the international flow of data. And this involves building trust in the use of data internationally, facilitating those cross-border data flows and driving standards and inter interoperability internationally. Um, and we would see that as an opportunity to promote UK values across the world because the mm -hmm. UK continues to be a huge supporter of global free trade and free trade is underpinned by the free flow of data. So uh, that's why, for instance, in, in our current free trade agreements, we're seeking to remove barriers to that free flow, and that includes unjustified data localization, but it doesn't include lowering the standards of protection afforded to the personal data of UK individuals. So as we come to the end of the EU transition period, the UK is hugely committed, as committed as ever, to serving as a force for good in the world, shaping global thinking, promoting the potential benefits of data, while guarding against those malign influences and in pursuing that agenda, we really hope that we can continue to collaborate 
really closely with the EU because while there can be no guarantee in this field, both the UK and the EU through their respective strategies have highlighted the importance of data as a tool for global competitiveness. And as with all policy areas, the UK will, will want to control our own laws and our own regulations in line with our interests. But we'll want our data protection law to remain fit for purpose and to support the future objectives of, of the UK within the world. So that that's why I think, and, and I, th I think this does echo a lot of what, what Dieter said, that we, we want a high quality regime that promotes growth and innovation and underpins trustworthy use of data. And, and laws will inevitably develop uh, as technology and business practices and, and sit the needs of citizens change. But in terms of obstacles, there are challenges in providing the right incentives and, in, and environment for cross economy sharing and collaboration and ensuring the responsible and ethical deployment of increased data use, as well as the promotion uh, of homegrown technologies, will require us to avoid practices such as that unjustified data localization. Yeah, thank you, Matt. That's very clear, also very helpful. Cecilia, a few words from your side on the data and sovereignty issue, but let us uh, I see that the clock is running. Uh, just briefly, your, your main take on it. Uh, Celia, your your microphone. We can't. We cannot hear you. Sorry, I forget that it's not centrally controlled. Uh, so, uh, so sovereignty uh, it basically means the authority of a state to govern itself, and I, and uh, and I think uh, every state uh, that would have serious security issues with something, uh, you know, will will honor that principle, and they already do now. And having said that, let's absolutely limit that concept to the security discussions. And then, of course, right now we are in a kind of an interim, hopefully, knock on wood, I'm a positive uh, person, interim period on data governance uh, alignment globally. So we are, have aligned now in Europe, we have the GDPR. Uh, now we see that, you know, the personal data, we have countries that are given adequacy or we have an adequacy negotiations with, that solves the problem, you can say. Um, but basically, uh, this is we need to continue that path of aligning uh, data access, data protections uh, to make sure that we can, we can basically uh, develop a common framework. Yeah, and that's 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 also pretty cl clear guidance, I would say. Um, Marta, you've got the final take very briefly on this topic. So, just. Uh... You know, the discussion about sovereignty exists in a certain context that is political, economic. We are at a given at a, at a given point in history, so I think we cannot escape uh, we cannot we cannot escape that context. Context while in an academic discussion we could prob probably find more pro arguments for data sovereignty. But looking at uh, where we are at this given. Uh, time. I would like to actually quote the words of the moderator of this panel um, and, 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 and two concepts that uh, you Paul mentioned once in a, in a political article which resonate with me and I think and generally at Google the most. Looking at strategic interdependence and working with like-minded countries should be the guiding principle bearing in mind the context in which we, um, in which we operate. I think uh, we also need to, looking at all the strengths that, are, that exist in the European digital ecosystem, we also have to be very realistic about the fact that the uh, European population is only 10% of global population. If we want to come up with global solutions, if we want to be part of the big, Europe, big global um, competition and game, uh, we also need to bear in mind that, as, that we need to be um at the same time welcoming to 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 other ecosystems but at the same time uh, going out there and and to benefit from uh other ecosystems yeah. uh, that, as well that, that's very helpful marta sorry that i need to interrupt here because the regime is pushing me to uh to watch the time given the other session thank you very much for for uh, pointing out this sense of realism and uh, bringing uh, the discussion with the feet on our ground and uh, being um, 
uh, still developing in, in, in an open mindset. And thank you for quoting uh, also that article on that. I was a bit surprised about uh, the response from the audience. Two thirds says data is to be part of sovereignty and one third says no. I think that's very, uh, of course, I was really not fair, an unnuanced question uh, with uh, only an unnuanced answer that you can give, but it's a point that we can, that I think uh, gives, gives a starting point for the further debate. I found this a very interesting session, a great panel. Um, I love to continue this type of discussion with you much more in depth because I think in Europe we are really in need of these views that bring us uh, much further and go, uh, bring us away from the theoretical discussion, as a matter of fact, to something that's really workable policy um, and, and executes the policies that we have today in a workable way. Very positive note also in this panel, so great thanks. Uh, from my side and the organizers to your participation and I wish you um, an interesting continuation of the day and of this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much, Paul. Thank you. Much is being done at the European level, but there still seems to be plenty to be done as well, especially as far as the regulations and steps to be taken are concerned. Of course, steps to be taken about the invisible and yet very material data. I hope you noticed that we've asked you for opinion and Mr. Timas was quite surprised that the question whether data becoming an element of sovereignty, just like territory, national resources and population should, according to 64% of you, be a part of our sovereignty and therefore we were left with just 36% saying no. Well, this is the broad picture for today.